to begin. Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we have the privilege of entering into your presence. And as we come to this time of our service, as we have sung songs of praise and worship to you, as we open your life-giving word, I pray that your word will speak to our hearts and our minds and that you will draw us closer into your presence. Father, these challenging words through these verses of Scripture are only here to help us be more like you. So Father, I pray that you will help and teach us how we are to respond to not only difficult people, but how we are to respond to difficult circumstances in this life. Father, trials are inevitable. Temptations are inevitable. But your people are called to die to ourselves and live for you. So, Father, we thank you for this word. I pray that you will open our hearts and minds to it and that the name of Jesus will be glorified and honored today. And it's in his name and for Christ's glory that we pray. Amen. 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 James chapter 5. We're going to finish this portion of Scripture. I know you don't hear those words come out of my mouth very often. Um, we take our time through the Word, and this portion of Scripture, I believe, we can cover today, verses 7 through 11. We're only going to cover verses 10 through 11, but I'm going to read those Scriptures in just a moment to keep it in its context, because we're talking about the subject of how to face trials patiently. Those two words don't seem to mix, do they? It's, it's almost as if you need to end your sentence before you say the other. Trials and patiently don't seem to mix very well. But we've learned that trials and difficulties, and persecutions, tribulations, sufferings, they're all inevitable. They're inescapable. There's nothing that you can do on your end. There's nothing you can do in your own power to escape a trial. There's nothing you can do in this world, good or bad, to escape a suffering. Because that's the world we live in. So we've learned that you're going to suffer, I'm going to suffer, they are going to suffer, we are all going to suffer. So trials are, are going to have to be learned how to be endured. You can't escape them, so we need to learn how to deal with them. How do we respond to them? And Christians, according to these scriptures and many others throughout the Bible, Many the Christians were reminded to be patient in those trials. But for Christians, as we've alluded to over the last several weeks, there's this unique kind of persecution that non-Christians don't have to endure. And that's the persecution for the truth. The world is going to have trials and problems, but for the Christian, we have to learn how to obey the Scriptures. We can't, we can't react as the flesh desires to react because we represent Christ. It's Christ in us. So what we're learning is that the believer is not to resist the attacks of evil people. The Christian is not to retaliate when we're persecuted. 
so the believer is not to fight back out of vengeance. I don't know about you, I can only speak for myself, that's a really difficult thing to do. I know that I'm spirit-filled, I know that Christ is my Savior, I know that I am 100% saved. But boy, that nasty flesh wants to fight back when he's attacked. You can keep quiet if you want, make me feel like I'm all alone up here, but that's fine. According to the Bible, the believer is to let vengeance belong to God. You know, when Christ, our, our Savior, when he was reviled, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus did that. And Jesus had the power to put a stop to all of the garbage that he endured. Mere people that were abusing him, accusing him, slandering him, and yet says he didn't revile in return. He didn't slander back. He didn't fight back. He didn't retaliate. He said, this is Jesus. Committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed his life to God his Father. Well, this word patience, which we're going to find in these verses, they're found four times in verses 7 through 11. And it all has to do with enduring adverse people. Remember, we use the word macrothumia, which is not dealing with difficult circumstances, it's dealing with difficult people. It's bad enough that we have to have hard times that we have to walk through, but now we've got to walk through difficult times and also deal with difficult people. So as hard as this may be, just like our Lord Christ said, we have to learn to accept suffering without retaliating. So here's our portions, beginning in verse 7, to keep it in its context. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. You see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at, is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, and that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. It's quite a lot to swallow. So here, James... He's calling for believers to apply patience, again, to not only trying in difficult circumstances, but to trying in difficult people. Again, I make the joke all the time, that our church knows this, this world would be a great place to live if it didn't have people. But that's not the case, is it? So obviously the question that arises from this portion of Scripture is how am I supposed to apply patience? Because it says four times that I am supposed to be patient. Well, how do I apply it and what is it? So here we, we find six practical ways to apply patience during trials. The first one we've already covered is we are to anticipate the Lord's return. I know that sounds easy to say because ever since he left, the church has been waiting for him to come back. And in fact, the early church thought he was coming back the following week. 
And they kept waiting and waiting, quit their jobs. They took out their lawn chairs and sat back and said, we're waiting for Jesus to return. And then Jesus didn't return, and I'm sure it caused a lot of confusion and had to be dealt with because these people were not doing anything. They were just waiting. They're going to starve to death if they didn't continue to work. And the command was given, if you don't work, you don't eat. So get back to the normal process of life because we don't know when Jesus is going to return. So anticipate the Lord's return. And how does that, how does anticipating the Lord's return make things better? Because it, don't, it won't always be this way. Difficulty, the one at least you're walking through right now, won't always be this way. I'm not saying that the one that you're about to take on won't be more difficult. But I don't know if you've noticed, but life changes. Changes often. Most of the time it changes unexpectedly. Sometimes comes with a phone call. Sometimes it's a text message. Sometimes it's just life dealing with the way life deals. So James 5, 7 says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, when? Until the coming of the Lord. Just keep waiting, because it's not always going to be this way. And then James says in verse 8, Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He's reminding us, Establishes that, remember that strong word that means to be resolute. Set your track. Get it set in your minds that you're going to serve Him until He returns. Will it happen in your lifetime? I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to sit up here and play like I know this answer. Be foolish if I did. So this is an attitude of firm courage. It's an attitude of commitment no matter what the trial is, I'm going to confidently move ahead. And remember, the root word for this is, is a prop. It's like to prop yourself up on, which is kind of strange to use, but that, in essence, that's what it, it means. I'm, while I'm waiting, and the trials and the temptations and the, and the aggravations of life seem to get overwhelming, I'm to prop myself up on the truth. Lean on it. Don't waver. Don't lose hope. Don't faint under the pressures of life, but be resolute. Thank you, brother. And that's the truth. Number two. None of us are guilty of this. But don't grumble while you wait on the Lord to return. Mm. But why is that such a big deal? You know why? Because it says, lest you be condemned. Not the, not the guy that's doing all the evil junk against you, but you don't grumble while you're waiting on God. Who are you to grumble? And I'm going to say, again, I'm 55. I can't say that you've been... confidently good in finding an answer to life's problems, but I have found that even when I grumble, it doesn't fix the problem. Maybe you're different than I am. Maybe I'm living in a separate world than you are. But grumbling doesn't fix anything. Lest you be condemned, behold, the judge is standing at the door. James is warning here that when the Lord comes... And we're all waiting for that to happen. But do you know that when it happens, that when Jesus does come, there is going to be a judgment. That is the truth. The Bema judgment. You are going to give an account of what you've done as a believer. So it's not only just the believer that's going to be judged. Those that have rejected Him will also be judged. That is sobering. We've covered that, and I won't recover, but number three, follow the Lord's servant's examples. 
We find this in verse 10. My brethren, take the prophets, spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Again, I, I can't speak for you, but I, I know I can say confidently that no one wants to suffer. I don't find joy in suffering, but it's part of this life. And obviously it's good for me. No one wants to suffer because Jesus even gives us an example that suffering is very difficult to walk through, but being that we are going to suffer, Jesus says in John 13, 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. He didn't leave us hanging like, I'm supposed to figure this life out. I don't know, how am I supposed to respond when life becomes really difficult? Am I supposed to just act? Am I supposed to just respond the way my flesh desires to respond? No, Jesus says, I've given you an example of how to respond. And not only through Christ, but I've given you examples of people. The prophets. They've suffered and they were patient. And I can just about say for sure you have never been through the suffering that the prophets have gone through. Never. You may have felt like it, but you never have. But the examples of their life showed that they patiently waited for the Lord to return. They patiently waited for the coming judgment. They patiently followed the examples of Christ. And again, who were the prophets? Those who spoke the Word of God. The, the Bible tells us that. Number four, when we face trials and how we do this with patience, it's where we pick up this baton, understand the Lord's blessing. Understand the Lord's blessing. James 5.11 Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. That's another word I don't like to use and hear. Endurance. Endurance always comes with a little pain, doesn't it? I used to be a runner. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but I've never seen a runner with a happy face. I always see them with extreme pain and anguish. And what are they doing? They're trying to endure to the end of the run. Well, now that same look that people gave when they're running, I have when I walk. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm boasting because I can walk three miles. But it, it's not pretty. It's, it doesn't look pretty. Well, so this word endurance comes with the this, this sense of there's going to be pain along with it. And we call people who endure through trials and temptations blessed. That's what the first part of James, this book, started with. He said in chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Blessed? For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life? In other words, it's the crown which is life, eternal life. Well, that's quite a prize, isn't it? It's better than anything you can buy at Walmart. Or that other word, Amazon. The, that's the word we don't use here. So what James is saying here is, understand the Lord's blessing. You're going through a trial. You're, you're going through some really difficult times, whether it be through circumstances or whether it be dealing with really hard to deal with people. He said, understand the Lord's blessing. In other words, people who are going through a trial are considered to be blessed by God when they endure. 
Listen, the blessings don't come to people who do great things. Blessings come to people who endure great things. If I go and give a, a million bucks to a, to a good business venture, the, my blessings aren't going to be the way God blesses me if I endure temptations and trials. The ones who's going to receive the greatest reward in heaven are the ones that endure the greatest suffering in this world. That's how the Bible teaches. It doesn't seem to mix, does it? The brain has a way of trying to protect itself. That it's saying that if, it, if there's suffering involved, if there's endurance involved, then I need, to, I need to find a way around this. You can't. The greater the suffering, the greater the reward. So James says, understand that God blesses those that endure in this life. And it's not just endures, you're, you're enduring without grumbling. <laughs> Add that cherry on top. So we are to endure the terrible circumstances. We are to endure the evil treatment of people in this world. And then the Bible tells us when you do, I've got a great big blessing for you awaiting. Maybe y'all don't want to have any blessings. Maybe y'all don't want to have any rewards. I do. Is that greedy? No, because the Bible said that I would. Number five, realize the Lord's purpose. Sure doesn't seem like it, but God has a plan in all this. It's what verse 11 says goes on to tell us. He says, You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. You have heard the perseverance of Job. You've heard of the endurance under the trial of Job. Wow. And he goes on to says, And have seen, and then you see that word end. It's better translated, the purpose of the Lord. That's the end. God has a purpose in it. Boy, it's hard to see when you're walking in it, isn't it? Church. Hard to lift your eyes out of pain, suffering, endurance. So in other words, this Scripture is telling us, consider this, that God has a purpose in your trial. He has a purpose in your suffering. And I know that sounds easy to say. And I know that preachers have always said it. It's the truth. But I need you to hear me. God would never allow a trial in your life if the faith He provided was false. You hear me? If the faith that He gave you because we are saved by faith, by grace, through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is a gift. What's a gift? Faith is a gift. Dead men don't create faith. God gives me faith to have faith in Him. You hear me, church? So if He's given you a trial, that means the faith that you have to persevere, to endure that trial, is not going to fail. Why do you think he put Job through what he did? He knew that the faith that he provided Job was real. And Satan didn't know that. God allowed Job's trial because he knew Job's faith would not fail. That's quite a story. And the words you hear, you have heard, simply means that the story was, was common knowledge. Job was one of the most popular and familiar stories of Jewish tradition. 
I mean, here's the story of a righteous man. You have the story of a passionate God. And then you have the story of a man who defeats Satan in the power of God. I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? You just don't want to be the one they're talking about. You'd rather them talk about Job than you would you. Job was a godly man. Says it. God said it. Satan comes to God and says, I don't think that you have one man on this earth who would be true to you. That was the challenge. And God replies to Satan, and I know I'm taking this kind of out of context, but you can read the Scriptures, it's, it matches. God says to Satan, yes, I do. Satan says, okay, take everything away that he has, and that man will curse your name. He only loves you because you've given him stuff. It's quite a challenge, and you would think, God the Father says, no, let's protect Job. No, God says, go ahead. Go ahead, Satan, but you can't kill him. It's the limit. You can do just about everything you want with him, but you can't kill him, and I'll prove to you that he's a faithful man. What does Satan do? He takes the challenge, doesn't he? And it, it says in that conversation in Job, he immediately began to attack. Satan goes after his family, kills all his children. Satan <laughs> takes away all his crops, takes away all his land, takes away all his possessions, everything that he owned. And then, to put the cherry on top, he gives them a, a severe disease. So now you've got the pain and anguish of losing Everything that you know. And then you've got physical pain on top of it. Sign me up for that one. And in it all, Job never wavered. He endured. There's that nasty word. He endured. He complained now and then, but mostly about his dumb friends, I can use that word in here, right? Who were giving him some really stupid answers as to what was really going on. He complained about them quite a bit. His wife even tried to get him to curse God and die. He refused to do that. This is his answer. Though he slay me, Yet I will trust Him. Boils, family's gone, land's gone, everything He had, the Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Is that the way you would answer? Incredible man. He endured, he endured, he endured. And we don't even know really the, the time frame that all of this was going on. Some people say six months, some people say a year, some people say a few days. I, does, it, does it really matter? The pain that he was enduring was enough, whether it was a day or a, a year. He cries out to God in confusion. He listens to his friends who give him the wrong reports as to why all of this is happening. But he endured. He endured. And the Bible even says that he did not sin with his words. Wow. This man went through the most incredible trial. And this is why he's mentioned. He's mentioned throughout the Scriptures, and especially here. 
because we're dealing with difficult circumstances, we're dealing with difficult people. You have the death of children, the death and loss of possessions, down to nothing, body covered with disease, and still he says, though he may slay me, yet I will serve him. We've got a lot to learn, don't we, church? And this is, this is the right response. And I believe this is an extreme. I mean, I don't know of at least my understanding of the Scriptures that there's anybody that's ever been through what Job has gone through. But the same faith that Job was provided is the faith that God provides you. Why do I say that? Because it's God's faith. You understand that, church? He even goes further in the book, Job chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. He is going through hell on earth. And that's what he says. He says, God will never forsake me. Is that the way you endure? Why? Why, why does... Job, why does he have this ability? Why does he see something? Why does he endure? Because he sees the purpose of God. Maybe not clearly, but do you really believe that the God that you put your faith in for yourself, salvation, eternal life, that he's going to somehow let you down? That somehow along the way in your life he's going to screw up? At the end, Job says, 42.5, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Wow. And he responds with, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What does he mean by that? Now I know who you are, God. Wow. Never saw you in my good times as clearly as I see you in my bad. I see you who you are. I see you have a purpose for me. That's what he sees. Can you say that? But what exactly was God's purpose for Job? Well, there are several. One, to test his faith. Do you think that was a test for God to know if his faith was real? No. It was for him to know his faith was real. I mean, God's not going to waver on this. He knew that his faith was real. He gave it to Job. And he knew that it wasn't going to fail. So the test was for Job to know that his faith was real. Second reason, I believe, is to strengthen his faith. You walk through a difficult time and you're not destroyed. When you get to the other end, you see God more clearly. Don't you want to, don't you want to see God more clearly? You're not going to see it sitting on top of a mountain. You'll see him in the valley. Third thing is to prove to Satan that there was a man that's totally committed to God, no matter what it costs. Satan couldn't say anything else, could he? So I took, I took away, I did everything I could but take his life. And what happened in the end? Hmm. And I think that there's a fourth reason it's to bless Job more than he was blessed before. <laughs> he, he received it. He was blessed because he endured. You don't believe me? Okay. Job chapter 42, starting in verse 12. Now the Lord blessed the latter 
days of Job more than his beginnings. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. And you're just thinking, I don't want animals. Where am I going to put donkeys? He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemimiah, the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Kareen Habuk. In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. It's pretty good news. Is that the way your story is going to end? I don't know. But I know that there's a promise for you. God blessed him. That was the purpose of God. So can you handle the fact that when you go through a trial, God has a greater purpose in mind? Can you handle that? Because that's the truth. But David, that was only for Job. No. God has this for you also. How do I know that? Well, how about Romans chapter 8, verse 28? And we know who's we. Yoo-hoo! And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose, for when He, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren, moreover whom He predestined, these He also called, whom He called, these He also justified, and whom He justified, these He also glorified. yoo That's pretty good news. Do, y'all, do you not want eternal life? Okay, I do. So uh, we have patience in any trial that comes your way. We anticipate the Lord's return. Don't grumble while you wait for the Lord. Recognize the Lord's judgment. Get busy, church. Follow the Lord's service example. Understand the Lord's blessing. Realize the Lord's purpose. Because He is doing something. You may not see it. He's doing something. God doesn't sleep. And finally, I know it's gone a little longer than I normally do, but the sixth. We need to understand the Lord's character. When you're walking through a trial, and He's telling us that when you walk through it, you need to do it with patience. You need to trust the Lord's character. You know, when you're enduring a really difficult situation or you're dealing with a really difficult person, do you ever question the character of God? I know I've been guilty. You know, Job asked those questions, Lord, are you there? Do you know Do you know what you're doing? Well, whatever you're going through, God is compassionate. As it says at verse 11 that the Lord is very compassionate and and merciful. Do you trust His character? Whatever you're going through, God is merciful. He has His pity. That's what Lamentations 3, 22-24 say. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Through the Lord's Mercies, we are not consumed. What 
do you think you deserve? Church, what do you, what, really, what do you think you deserve? I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I deserve judgment. I deserve to be wiped out from the face of this planet because I can't keep things straight in my own life. That's what I deserve. You know what you deserve? The same thing. For some odd reason, we think we have this mentality to think that we have the right to something. What? Why and what purpose do you think you do? Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. That's His character. I mean, we want to blame God when things go bad, but when has He really ever messed up? The devil is governing this world. God bears our infirmities. God carries our cares. He doesn't have to. Why do I deserve anything? Why do you deserve anything? Why do you deserve to be cared for? That the God of heaven looks down on you with favor? I wasn't around when he created. I came in, in the, like a little speck in this massive amount of time and lived 55 years so far and complained a lot during that time. Why do I deserve anything? Why do you deserve anything? That's why the Bible says, cast your cares on him for he what? Cares for you. Who? You. Who's you? You. How do we know God cares for you that way? Well, for one, we're not consumed. And two, look at the cross. You know why he did that? You know why he did that? For you. Well, let him bear your burdens. God knows your trial. He didn't say that you had to like it. But if you endure trials, if he's bringing you through something, it's, it's for your own good. Maybe you've got some rough edges that need to be chopped off. Yeah, you probably do. When he chops them off, it's going to be painful. But the end result is we're going to be like Jesus. So he knows it. Be patient in it. Know all of this is going to come to an end. I've reminded you before that we are in this proving ground. We're in this test of life. It's how you walk through and pass these tests. It's going to matter how you walk into eternity. I guess all of you know that you are going to die one day, right? Those of you that don't think you are, please come talk to me after the service. We have a lot to discuss. I want you to stand before God prepared, ready. But obviously the only way you can do that is with Christ. Christ reminds us that He is the way, 
He is the truth, and He is the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him. So if you're relying on any other way, you're relying on a wrong thing. I pray for you, church. I do. We're walking in difficult times. He's left us here for a reason. He's chosen us in these last days of history. I know they've been saying that all along, but there's a lot going on right now. And when the trumpet blows, the church is gone. You don't get to press rewind. I want you to be ready. I've been talking about that for a long time. But I do pray for you. I pray for you as you walk through trials that you are successful, not only successful, but you are, your faith is being built stronger and stronger. You need strong faith to walk in this world. And if you're sitting out there and don't have any idea what I'm talking about, you must put your faith in Christ. Without Christ, you have nothing. Our Father, we thank You for the love that You have for us because You give us Your truth that we can walk in it. The subject of trials and persecution and endurance, pain, suffering, all of those words we don't like to hear but are a necessity of this life. I pray f for this body of believers that we will stand as pillars of strength and as light for the people that are in darkness. That we will boldly speak the name of Christ to those that are around us. Father, we have no hope in any other but You. Our lives are in Your hands. You've bought us with a price. And it's with the very blood of Your Son, Jesus. I pray that You will give us strength to walk and that we will have a mighty testimony for those that are around us. Take the, the Scripture and help us to apply it. Your Spirit is the only one that can give us that ability to open our hearts and minds to Your truth and walk in that truth. May You be honored here, Lord Jesus. May the name of Jesus Christ be lifted up and draw men to You. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Amen.